Okay, one second here. Let's see. Should R. Share screen. We can do this. Okay. Participants chat. What's that? Review. Okay, there we go. Okay, are our uh, slides visible? Are they fine? Great, that's what I like to see. And I guess that tells me my audio and video are probably also working too. It took me a second to get set up. I walked in here and I had files transferring from one USB drive to a USB hard drive. Those two plugs being the ones I use for my camera. So I'm sitting here like, finish, finish. And then, okay. So sorry about that. Okay. Uh, let me see. So I'll give just a, you know, 30 seconds or so and then I'll get uh, rolling here. Uh, anybody have any sort of questions here at the start? You should have turned in one, your first homework on Tuesday, which could potentially have been a new and terrifying experience or something relatively straightforward. Um, have any questions about how anything's going to work, logistics or anything? I have a question. When I was trying to do um, in our markdown, trying to do the uh, ordered list, um, the in your slide you said just type in one dot, okay. the whatever the text is, it didn't work. Um, so it should be, make sure you have a blank line above it. So it needs to be sort of separated by one full blank line and then it need to be like uh, any single digit or any number basically followed by a period and then a space and then text and then it should work. And if that doesn't work, send me the R&D and I'll check it out. If you run into any kind of problem like that, it's something mysterious, hit the Slack channel or hit email. Um, just, you know, because of it, I, I tend to get to the, that stuff like really fast um, if I'm around. And it's the same thing for the header because sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Does it have to be a blank line about that too? Uh, I believe so. So the idea in Markdown um, is that Anything, so if you write something and you write something, you do one entry, you write something on the line right below it. For markdown, um, sequential lines like that are treated as a single line in printed output. The reason for that is that if they didn't do that, you wouldn't be able to write like a whole paragraph that stretches, you know, from one line to line to line to line to line. You'd have to write one really long one. And so it doesn't treat them as line breaks if there's only one. You need a full blank space. Um, gotcha. Yeah. Thank you. Anything else? Uh, just to clarify about the peer review, I feel like you maybe said this last week. Um, so it says on Canvas or on the website that we have until the next class period to do that. So would that be like next Wednesday or Tuesday. Monday? So or? End of Tuesday. Uh, so same time your homework is due. So your homework is due at 11.59, the peer review also. It's just rolling, you know, it's like you, you do a homework and then uh, exactly one week after that one was due, somebody will peer, have finished peer reviewing it. Okay, uh, thanks. Try and make everything 11.59 on a Tuesday uh, in, in the hopes that that generally works. Okay, um, then I will get moving. So today is another one that's kind of a longish one, um, but this is a, a, a fun day and an important one. So we're gonna be talking about plotting with ggplot today. So before we do that, I want to cover a few quick sort of useful and important things to lead us in there. <clears throat> so um, you might have noticed, for instance, that I write code sometimes that looks like this, where I'll write like new dot object, assign to that the numbers 1 through 10, 1 colon 10, if you remember, is a shortcut for the numbers 1 through 10. Uh, then I write a pound sign or hashtag for the kids uh, that says making vector of 1 to 10. This little pound sign is the commenting symbol. Anything you write on the same line after that symbol will not be treated as code. It's just some text. 
This is how you annotate your code so that um, it, you, somebody else knows what you did. And by somebody else, that includes like future you. Um, future you is often um, not a big fan of past you if past you did not comment your code very much, okay? Uh, I know that past Chuck remains my greatest enemy um, and bad code commenting is one of those reasons. Also sometimes his love for beer. Um, so yeah, uh, comment your code, it's a good idea. Um, and you'll know what you did later when you revisit a project, you sit down for six months or something like that. Okay. Um, in our markdown documents, of course, those pound signs set off headers, but in chunks, comments work like this. So anything that I talk about that's written in our code, including comments, that's stuff that would go inside chunks in your R markdown. Okay. So saving and opening files. So you can save any R object at all, no matter what it is, on your computer using the save function. If you say save new dot object, and then you say the file you want to save it to is new object dot R data, it's going to save this object wherever that is on your uh, computer. You can open these saved files using load. If you do load new object here, it's gonna load this object back in and it's gonna load it with the same name you saved it as. Here's a question I missed up here. Um, do the comments show up on the markdown file within the chunk like the code does? Yes, they do. The, the comments will also be visible. Uh, next. Um, so uh, a logical question from this is where are these files being saved to and loaded from if you type in a file name. So the answer to that is what is called the working directory on your computer. So this is a common term across uh, all sorts of things you'd be using on your computer. All software you're probably using without you necessarily realizing it has a current working directory. When you go to save like a document in Word, it's gonna pop open some default directory. That's its current working directory. Ours the same way. If you want to know what your current working directory is for R when it's open, you can type in your console or in your editor and do get WD, which is get current working directory. When I knitted these slides uh, earlier this morning, my current working directory was this. It's a really long file path because I like to nest things in lots of folders. That's where my R was currently looking for files and saving and loading them. Okay. Uh, you can set your working directory using set WD. So if you didn't want this to be your working directory, you could set it to, for instance, I set it to my documents folder here. This is an example of something that would work on my computer and not on your computers, unless you're stalking me to maintain work directories that have the same structure as mine on your computer. Okay. So do not ever set working directories in our markdown documents. The thing about our markdown documents is they automatically set the directory they are in to be their working directory. If you have an R markdown file, let's say in a folder called um, homework one in your, in your folder for this class, that R markdown uh, document will treat that folder as its working directory. This means you don't have to set it. Instead, if you want to access some data, put those data in that same folder, right? Um, yeah. So in my opinion, there are, well, there's a lot of ways you can manage files and manage folders on your computer. I have some strong opinions about how you should arrange your computer for sort of um, maximum usability, accessibility, and portability of things, sort of making your stuff maximally reproducible. When you're managing some R project, it's normally best to give every project its own folder. And a project can be all sorts of different things. Like I do have one overall dissertation project. Within that, each chapter has its own sub project. And then within those chapters, there are also sub projects for different things, right? Um, a homework assignment could be a project and you could put that in a folder for like the entire uh, class or something like that. This entire C++ 508 class is one, what I consider one project, right? I use a system like this. Every class or project will have its own folder. Each assignment or task will have a folder inside that, and that will be the working directory for that particular item. So there'll be a different sort of folder for every homework assignment, or in this case, every lecture in this class. 
the .rmd and .r files you use should be named clearly and completely so that if you had one of those files anywhere on your computer, you would know exactly what it related to. And so, for example, this presentation today is located here and named this. It's in my GitHub directory that I hide all of my, uh, my stuff that's hosted on GitHub. This is the class we're in. Today is a lecture, so it's in a lectures folder. It's in week two, so it's a week two folder. And then the total name for this file is CSSS 508 week two ggplot2.rmd, which tells me it's for this class in week two and the topic is ggplot2. It's totally unambiguous what this file refers to. And yeah, I can know exactly where to find it if I open up this, uh, um, my class sort of uh, directory here at CSSS 508. Okay. Um, you can use whatever system you want. You don't have to like copy what I'm doing, but the important thing is you should be try to be consistent so your projects are well organized. Um, you don't want to be losing work by uh, like not being able to find a file, overwriting files. Don't just put everything on your desktop or your documents uh, like folder, right? If you name something the same thing as an existing file, it will overwrite it. R is perfectly happy to overwrite files. It won't ask you if you want to do it. It will just overwrite them. So save things where you want them to go. Use proper names for things. Um, this will keep you from losing stuff or overwriting important things. If you have a large project that has many files, like for instance this class, I recommend using RStudio's built-in project management system, which you'll can find at the top right of RStudio. Let me see if I can uh, pop open and show you. Um, so for example here, um, let me uh, shrink this a little bit. Okay, oh, it's so huge to me. So in the top right of your RStudio window is this little sort of pull down menu and a little R thing. This up here is project management features for RStudio. You can create projects, you can open projects here, and you can quickly move between them. So for instance, right now my RStudio is this class, so this is today's lecture right here as an RMD file. If I wanted to jump, say, to the job talk I gave yesterday, I could just click job talk here, and you'll see it loads up exactly where I left off for this particular project, the things I'm working on, all that stuff is there. Projects let you jump quickly between different things you're working on so you don't have a whole mix of tabs and things up at the top of your RStudio. If I want to go back to working on this class, I could drop down to that menu to see SSS 508 and I'll pick back up where I was. So if you're working, as many of us are, on lots of different projects, maybe you're working on your thesis or dissertation, but you're also RAing for somebody, maybe, maybe you're building your professional website in R, whatever. You're doing all this stuff, you can just tab between these things up here and not have to have all these tabs open randomly, you don't have to browse around. The nice thing with these project management features is if I do get working, whoop, uh, get WD, this directory right here is the directory that this, uh, these files are in on my computer, the CSSS 508. If I swap back over here to this job talk, my working directory is now where this job talk is loaded. So it changes your working directory too in your console and everything. It's kind of like the way working in our markdown document where it has its own working directory. This is a way to never ever have to set working directories and manually work with any of that stuff. Let the computer do it by selecting projects. Okay. So if you're working on, say, a journal article or a thesis and you want um, sort of more advanced project management features, um, Ben Marwick over at Archaeology has a package called RR Tools for reproducible research tools, which will manage sort of a journal article as a R package. And he also has the package Husky Down, which is a way to um, create UW dissertations and theses using markdown documents instead of having to use LaTeX or formatting them in Word. So if you want to make a fully UW formatted dissertation or thesis, you can do it in a simple R markdown document using that package. Okay, so some cool handy stuff. Okay, um, file types. Uh, this is sort of some sort of uh, important stuff to just know and remember. Um, we're mainly working with three types of files in this class. We're working with .rmd files. RMD files are R markdown syntax files. These are the files that you would write code in if you want to make a document at the end. 
If you're going to be producing a memo or a homework assignment, you probably want an RMD. R syntax files are .r files. These are files in which you write code to process and analyze data, but they do not make an output document. They can perform all sorts of analysis, run all the code, but you don't use them to make documents. Okay? I don't use .r files very much in this class because I'm really kind of force feeding you R markdown. Um, but .r files are where you'll do most of your um, sort of like intermediate data analysis and manipulation work that you might then send to an R markdown document or something afterwards. Uh, and then also we work with HTML or PDF documents, and these are output documents generated when you knit an R markdown document, right? So just know the difference between these things. If any of that's ambiguous, feel free to ask me questions about it, get clarifying stuff. Um, it's not dumb questions to be asking about this stuff. Um, it should be quite new to a lot of you. Okay. Um, yeah, make sure you understand the difference. Ask me questions if you don't. Next little topic I want to talk about before we get into uh, making pretty pictures is some brief stuff on data and subsetting data. So um, today we're going to work with uh, data from Hans Rosling's Gapminder project. This is actually a data that's been cleaned up by uh, Jenny Bryan up at um, uh, University of British Columbia. Jenny Bryan being one of the um, biggest, most important people in the world of R, um, and this class is actually partially based on her old STAT 545 class. Uh, oh, and here's a question in chat. What about .r data files, different from .r? They are completely different. .r files are where you store the scripts you would write in your editor window. .r data files store actual data. They store what's contained in R objects. So .r data is a data storage format, and .r is essentially a text storage format that stores code. You could actually open a .r file in like Notepad, and you'll just see it's the same text you see in RStudio. It's just a plain text file. Now, so we're going to be working with these Gapminder data. Uh, you also use these for your homework this week. So to get the Gapminder data, you need to install it as a package. So in your console, if you type in install.packages and then gapminder in quotes or copy and paste it from my lecture slides, um, you'll install the package and then you can load it with library gapminder. That will make it available kind of the same way the Swiss data set is available from your prior homework. Okay, so the data frame we're gonna work with is called gapminder, the same name as the library itself, and it will become available once you've loaded the package. If you've done library gapminder, you should now be able to do this. I type here str for structure, get the structure of the gapminder data. What this structure here tells us is the type of data or the type of object it is, is a funny thing called a tibble. A tibble is just a data frame that's uh, customized for use with the tidyverse stuff that I'm teaching in this class. It says it is 1,704 rows long. It is six columns wide. Um, and it contains seven car six columns. These six columns right are country, continent, year, life expectancy, population, and GDP per capita. Okay, so these data are what in the social sciences we typically might call panel data. They are repeated observations of units at evenly spaced periods of time. Um, so they're observations nested in some kind of unit. So in this case we have Country is a factor with 142 levels. A factor is a type of categorical data. This basically tells us there's 142 different countries. Continent is a factor of five levels. Well, there's, the countries are in five different continents. So we have countries nested, or sorry, we have countries nested in continents. And then we have multiple year observations. So we have years like 1952 through 1997 and later. So every country is observed in these data in 1952, 57, 62, 67, 72, 77, five-year intervals all the way through 2007. Okay? And for each of these country year observations, we have their life expectancy in that year, population, and GDP per capita. Okay? Ah, that's a great question. What is INT? So I said this is a factor, this is a factor. Num is numeric. INT is integer. Integers are a type of numeric data, but they can only take whole number values. The only thing that's important that really differentiates integers from numeric variables is that they have exact numeric accuracy. 
uh, meaning that this number really is 1952 and not 1952.0001, which is something called a floating point number, I'll get into you later. Um, and uh, integers take up less storage space on your computer, which for most of us nowadays doesn't matter. We don't really care about the difference between a few bits or bytes here and there. But if you have, say, some data set that's got, I don't know, two, three, four billion rows, that integer data storage may actually begin to matter, like some mobility data I've worked with. Yeah. So um, I've already kind of gone under what's in here. Factors are categorical data. We're going to spend a bunch of time on factors way off in week uh, six, I think, or week five. Um, basically, it's just categorical data. Uh, it has a lot of observations, so you're probably not going to look at the entire thing at once the way we did with Swiss data. You don't want to print the Gapminder data into your homework because you don't want to give somebody 10 pages of output. Uh, it has a nested or hierarchical structure. It's panel data. Yeah, so um, to plot and work with these data, we need to know how to do a little bit of subsetting. So I want to show you just a tiny bit of subsetting, and then we'll get into pretty pictures, I promise you. So. Um, we want to be able to cut up or slice up this data frame into different subsets. And by subsets, I mean maybe we want just the rows for Afghanistan or just the rows associated with the year 1997. We're going to do this not using the stuff I showed you in lab, but rather we're going to do this using a package called dplyr. If you have some tangential familiarity with R, you've probably heard people talk about dplyr or something they use all the time and they love. Um, dplyr is part of the tidyverse family of packages, and most of the stuff I teach in this class revolves around this tidyverse. Um, the tidyverse is basically a large set of packages um, organized for data manipulation and visualization, made to have a similar syntax to be in compatible with each other and to be really easy for non-programmers to use. So I focus on them in this class. There's other approaches you can use to coding in R that are targeted more at people with a programming background like data.table, but I'm mostly going to be covering tidyverse. Here's a question in chat. Could you say a little bit more about what is panel data? So if you have any data structure where you have um, a unit like people, or a country, and it's observed multiple times over time, that's panel data. That's all it is. Panel data means the same units were um, uh, observed multiple times. And they usually imply that like everyone was, uh, like say it's interview data, everyone was interviewed in like the year 1995, and then everyone was re-interviewed again in 1996. Usually it's the equally spaced, or at least the same spacing for everyone involved. Common panel data sets include every cohort study you've ever heard of, um, uh, a lot of um, experimental data when they do repeated observations. It's just repeated observations of the same people. If you do repeated observations over time, but it's different people each time, it's not panel data. It's repeated cross sections. Okay, so if you haven't done this yet, uh, go ahead and in your console say install.packages tidyverse. This is something that's going to install a frighteningly large number of packages on your computer. It's probably going to install the better part of 100 packages on your computer. There's a lot of stuff in the tidyverse and a lot of dependencies of other packages that use this. You're going to use them, going to need them all. This might be running for a minute. We'll do it. Um, are packages a series of coding? So a package is a series of code. So a package is actually just a um, a way to distribute functions and data in R. A package is just a collection of functions that usually are oriented around some particular similar purpose. It's just a bunch of functions. When you install a package, you get new functions you can use, which is the real power in R. Okay, so yeah, it's gonna install a lot of them. The main one we're gonna focus on briefly is dplyr, but we're gonna use most of the packages in the tidyverse throughout the rest of this term. Okay. We're just going to do some data filtering with it for now. So if you want to load up dplyr, you can just say library dplyr. And if you've installed the tidyverse or just installed dplyr, it should load up. You're probably going to get something uh, that looks a little bit like an error message. Okay. So uh, do I have a, okay, it didn't, eh, didn't pop it up. That's interesting. Okay. So you may see an error pop up that says something like, this. You might see something pop up in your console. It's going to say like attaching dplyr. The following objects are masked from package stats. 
the following objects are masked from package base. This is not an error message, though the text is scary and in red. What this is instead is a message telling you that when you load the dplyr package, it has some functions that have the same name as functions that already exist in R. When you load dplyr, it overwrites or masks those functions with the same names. Okay? If you load a, a library, a package that is with functions with the same name as something already loaded, it's going to cover them up. Okay? This just lets you know it. If you don't want this to show in your R Markdown document, load your libraries in a chunk that either has message equals false set or include equals false and it will hide it. This isn't a bad thing, it's just letting you know that's what it's doing. Okay. Um, sometimes you might get another thing. You might get something like this, a warning message when you load it that says like, the package Gapminder was built under R 3.5.3, or in your case right now, 4.0.2. If you're seeing that, um, that is actually a warning telling you to update R. It's saying that your version of R is older than the version that package was created for. So when you see one of these things pop up after installing a package, that's just time for you to update R. Up, R tends to update four times per year, once quarterly. Get used to installing it all the time. That's fine. Okay, so now the fun stuff. Dplyr allows us to use something called the Magritter forward pipe operator to pipe data between functions. The forward pipe operator is a big name for a simple concept, and if you've ever programmed in a, uh, in a scripting language, like if you use just like bash scripting, you're going to know exactly where this is going. If not, ignore everything I just said. Uh, Magritter operators let us take things that are hard for humans to read and break them up into easier to read code. So let's say that what I want to do is I want to take the Gapminder data set and then extract the population variable, get its mean, and then take the log of that mean. Okay. I'm not a linguist, but I feel like there are not many human languages that read inside out. Okay, so going gapminder and then population, take its mean, take its log, is not useful to us. Many of us read left to right, some of us read right to left, we do not read in to out. Pipes allow us to break this code up sequentially, reading them left to right or right to left if you use the other operator. This now says, take the gapminder data, extract population, and then get the mean of it, and then get the log of it. We get the exact same answer, but now we read it in order. Take these data, and then take the mean, and then log them. And you can chain an arbitrary number of these in, or like in a sequence, as many as you want. Um, I have some horrifying scripts I could show you that have, uh, you know, 100 or 200 chained operations like that in a row, because I don't like making objects and I like chaining operations. We're going to use this throughout the class. Okay, um, so I kind of covered how you read that. We're going to cover this later, and we're going to spend the whole class chaining things like this, so it's okay if it doesn't make a ton of sense yet. Okay, here's an example of filtering some data down. If I say, take my Gapminder data and then filter so that country equals equals Oman, look what we get down here. I've taken my Gapminder data and now you'll notice every observation of this data set now has country equal to Oman. They're all Oman here. Okay, this is a way to subset to specific rows you want in a data set. I take some data, I filter it down, I get the thing that I want. Okay, we're going to show a lot of examples of filtering data like this. Okay, so this thing right here, this equals equals, ah, are there always two equal signs? Yes, this is something called a logical expression or a logical operator. We used equals equals for testing if country is equal to Oman. A single equal sign kind of works like an assignment operator. Two equal signs are for testing to see if something equals something, okay? 
So there are many logical operators we can use to make tests like this. For example, there is a not equals to. If what we wanted was every row in the data that is not in Oman, I could just change this first equals to an exclamation point and it would drop all the rows from Oman and keep everything else. There's also greater than, greater than an equal, less than, less than an equal. So for mathematical comparisons, if you wanna know, get rows where some variable is above or below a number, you can do that. There's percent in. This is used for checking if a variable equals one or one of multiple values. I could say instead of country equals equals Oman, I could say country percent in a vector of Oman and Yemen and get those two countries if it was either of them. That's complicated, I'll show it in a minute. Uh, we can also combine logical conditions. Maybe you want country Oman and year 1977. You can put those together and make combinations using and. You can have it so that at least one condition holds. Maybe I want every observation in 1977 and every year in Oman. I use an or sign, which is a vertical bar. It's the one below backspace and above enter on your keyboard. Uh, exclamation point will invert any logical condition. If you come up with any one of these logical operations that selects like uh, a bunch of things, if you put an exclamation point in front of it, it flips them so that everything you selected is what it gets rid of, basically. I'll show a bunch of examples of this. Uh, yeah, we're gonna use these constantly in the class, so don't worry about memorizing them. Just know that these things allow us to do logical tests. And I'll explain more about what logical tests are next week. We're just gonna see them in action now, and next week you're gonna see them in a lot more detail. And then even more, I think, in week four. So let's say that we want all the observations from Oman, but only after 1980 and through the year 2000. We could do something like this. I take the Gapminder data, and then I filter so that country is equal to Oman, and the year is greater than 1980, and the year is less than or equal to 2000. So I've said all three of these statements must be true because I have and signs with them. The resulting data look like this. I have four observations of Oman. The earliest one is after 1980, and the last one is the last observation that occurs up to the year 2000. So this is using multiple conditions to filter down to whatever you want. Right? This is analogous to filtering rows in uh, like Excel, except I think this is actually a little easier. So here's a question. If I did exclamation point country equals equals Oman, would I get every country that isn't Oman? Try it out and see what happens. I think that would work fine. You might have to put parentheses around it, but I think that will work. Okay. Easier thing is to put the exclamation point as the first equals sign there though. I can just try it. So. Yep, that works. So no exclamation point gave me Oman. Exclamation point in front reverses it and gives me everything except Oman. Yeah, it's always good to just check. Yeah, great question. Okay, so that's some filtering. That makes sense so far? We're gonna do some pretty basic stuff with it. You get pretty wild with filtering statements, uh, and we will as we go on. Okay, another thing you might wanna do is maybe you're gonna work with some subset of data repeatedly. Well, we can save it as an object in R, and I don't mean save it to disk, but just make it as an object, um, like you do anything else. I could say what I want is I want some data from China. I'm gonna name it China. So I say, I'm gonna create an object named China and assign to it the Gapminder data and then filter so that country is equal to China. It assigns it to this and if I get head China four, that'll show me the first four rows of China. You'll see the observations are all from China and it's the first observations. So what I did here, as you'll notice, is I did the assignment here before I said what I'm going to assign to it, and I can pipe statements as many as I want after that. The assignment all occurs right here at uh, the top. We're gonna see lots of examples of this, but basically no matter how many operations you wanna do after this sequentially, 
if you do an assignment up here, it runs everything on the right side, and then the result of that gets assigned to this object. Okay, you'll see some more examples. Okay, so now, finally, we're going to get to our ggplot unit. This remains my favorite R meme in existence, um, and uh, I always gaze upon it happily for a moment. Hmm. Okay, that's uh, Hadley Wickham, is the uh, main, uh, uh, the head data scientist at our studio and the main author of the tidyverse. Um, and then that in the back is 50 cent and G unit. Okay. So, um, if you remember, uh, base R plots we used last week. I said I pretty much am never going to use them again. That's not completely true. I'm showing this one. Okay. So, this is a plot using the China data I just created in base R. I say I want a plot of life expectancy on year. So, life expectancy is a Y variable, year is an X variable. I want to use data from China, the object I created on the last or previous slide. Uh, I give it an X label, a Y label, a main title. I make the dots red. I make the labels a little bit larger. Um, I make the title a little bit larger and I make the dots a slightly different size. These are all arcane arguments here. Like you'd have to know these things. Nobody thinks that by default point size should be PCH. There's no logic to that. That's fine. You don't need to memorize these because you're probably not going to be using it too much. Okay. This is a base R plot of China. So an alternative way of plotting that I strongly prefer, most people in the R world actually strongly prefer, is ggplot. ggplot is part of the tidyverse. Um, the idea behind ggplot is a different sort of fundamental philosophy of uh, plotting things. It's based on something called the layered grammar of graphics. It's kind of the idea that we can break plots up into different sort of nouns and verbs and combine them together to create like a, almost like a sentence that generates a plot, okay? So this is that same plot basically done up in ggplot. The syntax is completely different. This says, I'm gonna make a ggplot. The data I'm gonna make it out of is the China data. And then this AES, it's like, what is that? It's an aesthetic, which we're gonna to get to in a minute. X-axis is year, Y-axis is life expectancy, and then a plus sign, and on the next line, geom point. This is a very different looking syntax, and it's not even one function call. There are three function calls occurring here, and a function call just means you're using a function. I use three functions here. ggplot is a function, AES is a function, and geom point is a function, okay? So you're gonna use a lot of functions repetitively sort of adding things onto this, okay? So I'm gonna talk about the structure of this to give you some necessary vocabulary, and then we're gonna spend the rest of today drawing pretty pictures, okay? So ggplot graphics objects consist of two primary components. They consist of things called layers. Layers are the components that make up the graph. We add layers to a ggplot using the plus sign. So the plus operator is for adding a layer to a plot. You add things with a plus, okay? Layers include things like lines, shapes, text, uh, axis labels, backgrounds, all that kind of stuff. That is all layers on your plot. The second component are aesthetics. Aesthetics are things that control how your layers look. We set aesthetics using arguments to layer functions. If you put color equals red inside a layer function, it's going to make that layer red. Okay? This includes the locations of things, their colors, their sizes. Aesthetics will also determine how data map to appearances. So for instance, if you want dots to have their location mapped to a variable, so that variable for each observation, it's the dot is in a different place, you would say, I'm gonna map it to this variable as an aesthetic, okay? So this language is particular, but it will help you Google answers to these questions. I'm gonna keep going here. Layers are these components of a graph, and there's a lot of different layers in ggplot, and there's extension packages that add many different types of layers. Most common like uh, graph types have a layer associated with them. 
common layers are ggplot itself is a layer. This is a layer that initializes your ggplot object. You specify the data you're going to work with, and this draws a background for your plot. It also draws axes and things like that. Geom point is a layer that draws scatter plot points on your plot. If you want a scatter plot, you're going to use geom point. Geom line makes a layer of lines for doing line plots. There's also layers for titles, X labels and Y labels on your graph. Then there's interesting layers like facet wrap. This is a layer that will break your plot up into multiple plots stratified by some variable. That's a lot of confusing language for a really simple concept, so I'm going to show it to you visually in a little bit. Facet grid will break up a plot in, by multiple variables into many plots. If you've ever found yourself doing things like doing a different plot for, say, uh, male and female respondents in something, instead of making two plots, you could facet on that and it will automatically generate separate plots for them. And then there's also layers that do things like put themes on the overall plot and change how the whole thing looks. Theme black and white, for instance, will replace your gray background with a black and white one and alter how the rest of the plot looks. Okay. Here's a question in chat. Are ggplot and ggplot2 the same thing? So ggplot2 is the package. ggplot is a function in that package. So there was an original ggplot um, that uh, is basically died pretty early on because they moved to a different architecture. So ggplot2 is the package itself. Um, so you do library ggplot2, but the function you use is ggplot. Annoying, I know. Layers, again, are separated by plus signs. And for clarity, I usually put every uh, layer of a plot on its own line unless it's really like short. Okay, and we'll see this in a bit. And then aesthetics, again, aesthetics control the appearance of these layers. Aesthetics include things like X and Y, which you assign to a variable to set the location of dots or lines, color, groupings, which I'll show in a minute, size, if you wanna make big lines or small dots or whatever. And a common one is alpha, one of the few sort of unintuitive ones unless you do image manipulation. Alpha is the transparency layer. If you set alpha to 0.5, it's 50% transparent. It's good for laying things on top of each other so you can still see stuff behind them. Okay, so an important sort of language thing about ggplot um, is setting versus mapping. Okay, so layers take arguments that control their appearance, like the point and line colors or transparency. Arguments like color, size, line type, all these can be used directly on the layers. This is referred to as a setting aesthetic. If I say geom point color equals red, it's going to make every dot I generate red. Okay, This means it doesn't depend on the data. This is not looking at some variable in my data and choosing a color. Mapping aesthetics are aesthetics you put inside of AES. If I say geom point aesthetic color equals continent i'm now going to have a different color dot for each continent in my data so this is one color assigned to everything this is a color that is different for every value in my data okay we're going to see a lot of examples of this if you want all your dots red do it this way if you want a different color for each continent you do it this way so AES makes these things able to vary by a column in your data. Okay, um, yeah. So you can also set the AES like this in the original ggplot layer. If you do this, every subsequent layer you add to it will use the same aesthetics. If you want everything you draw in your plot to be the same colors and sizes and based on the same variables, you only need to write it once up in the ggplot call and it will propagate through. And I'll show that here in another slide. Okay, so this language may seem pedantic. I'm being very specific about the language and I'm spending a lot of time highlighting it. This is to make it easier for you to Google like uh, your questions. If you know how to search for these things and be like, well, what I wanna do is a mapping aesthetic in this layer, you're gonna find your answers on Stack Overflow and stuff real quick. So, okay, let's see it all in action. Let's get rid of all these dumb words and let's see some pictures. Okay, so let's build a plot from scratch. So let's begin with this 
ggplot function call. I'm going to say here, ggplot, we want the data to be the China data. And my aesthetic, I want x to depend on year. So at year is going to be on the x axis. I want y to depend on life expectancy. It's on the y axis. If I run this ggplot call, you'll get something that looks like this. You're going to get a blank canvas onto which you can conjure your dreams. You have life expectancy over here on the Y, year on the X axis, it's automatically filled in some tick marks and has put nothing there. It's put nothing there because we haven't asked it to draw anything. This ggplot layer generates a canvas, but it doesn't draw any dots or anything. So what we do is I add to it a geom point layer. So you'll see I do plus here, plus geom point. This adds scatter plot dots. The location of these is going to be the X year, the X location of an observation and its life expectancy for that one. So we see these dots kind of like that. Those are the actual observations in the data. We've mapped some stuff onto it, or sorry, we've, uh, yeah, we've mapped uh, year and life expectancy onto the location of these points. You'll see I put the AES for year and life expectancy up here. Because geom point comes after it, it inherits the same aesthetic. You can imagine it's the same as having written this in the geom point call, same result. It propagates. Okay, well, what I want is to gussy this up a bit. I say I want the dots to be red and size three. It just makes them bigger and it makes them red. These are setting aesthetics. They're all red, they're all size three, okay? So again, uh, there's a question in chat. What is AES? AES is short for aesthetic. It's just a way of telling ggplot how you want variables to map to things in your data. Okay. So can you ask a bit, uh, say a bit more about why data variables are in the AES call? This seems linguistically intuitive. It seems like it should be part of the data. Well, the variables are coming from the data. So this is saying, I'm going to use the China data. And then I want to make my plots aesthetics based on particular variables. These variables are, I want my x-axis to depend on the year variable, which is inside China, and I want my y-axis to depend on life expectancy, which is inside China. So you're specifying that these things are here in these data, but this here is saying how I want them to map to my actual plot. This is just the sort of syntax of it. It's a little odd at first glance, but as we go on, you'll start to realize the power of separating these things. Um, and the sort of nice thing about specifying this once and having it propagate to later things, especially when you get to more complicated plots that have, for instance, multiple data sets in them. Okay, uh, so here's a question. Can you help with this error? Object China not found. You most likely did not create the China data way back. Uh, here, this next one, Good. No, there we go. This slide right here, I created the China data as China, assigned to it Gapminder filter country China, that will make it. Okay, zoom, we are right here. Okay, next one, uh, do year life expectancy have to be called whatever they are in your data set or is this just saying name the X and Y axis this? No, this is actually the variables that exist in the data set. These have to match up to real variables because they tell it what columns to pull out of your data. Naming the uh, X and Y axes here is something we're going to do in a minute. Okay. So for instance, maybe I would want year to be capitalized, like you're sort of just asking. I capitalize year by saying the X label should be year with a capital Y. If you look down here, this is just changing Y to be a capital Y. So X label changes that text. Y label, Y lab changes it this way too. Life expectancy to spelled out life expectancy. So these variables stay the same because they're coming out of the data. This is me changing the labels for them on the plot. Okay. Next thing, I'm going to change a title. That is, I'm going to add it. I say GG title, life expectancy in China. It adds life expectancy in China to the top. Without it, with it. Okay, so I've added on a title. And then I change its theme. I say theme black and white, and you'll see, instead of having an ugly default gray background, we now have sort of a slightly nicer, less ink wasting uh, background using theme black and white. There's a lot of different themes, and you can download more of them. You can make it 
mimic Stata if you want, or Excel if you're masochistic. I don't know, you do you. There's all sorts of themes out there to match different things. Uh, some organizations also release theme packages that let you co uh, make your stuff look like theirs. Like there's a package from uh, um, the BBC has a package for um, making, it, their, making graphics look like theirs. The Economist has a theme too. Okay, so uh, another thing I might do is notice that my text here and here and here is a little small. I can add an argument in theme that says base size equals 18 and it changes the default font size to 18 point, which just makes everything a little bit bigger because I think the default size is 12 point. Okay, so now my plot looks a little bit better. Okay, do we have any questions about that? Now then, we'll complicate it. Okay, so this is not a bad plot. It's not truly hideous. I think it looks slightly better than our base R1. Um, but let's say we want to take this plot we have, but instead of plotting life expectancy in China, we wanted to plot every single country in the Gapminder data set at the same time. There's 154 of them. Let's modify this plot so that we can do all the countries at once. If all I do is I take the same plot we just generated, but I replace China with Gapminder, we get this monstrosity, okay? This is the exact same plot. The thing is here is we can't tell any of the countries apart. All of the countries' dots are exactly on the same like year for that observation, and they all overlap each other. We can't tell them apart in any way. This is not a useful plot. Okay, so let's start tweaking this thing until it looks the way we want. And the reason I'm doing it this way is uh, so I can show you sort of the actual process you'll do this. You'll take like an existing plot you have and modify it bit by bit or add things bit by bit to it. You don't like generate this entire thing. Uh, I mean, I do sometimes because I've been doing this a really long time. But normally what you'll do is you'll do like make your GG plot and your G on point and then you'll just keep adding things on until it looks the way you want. Okay, here's a question here. I noticed that the size change when I changed my size of my panel in R. Is there a default size that you added into R markdown? Uh, yeah, so if you move your uh, little panel window in R Studio, the size of everything changes depending on it. In R markdown documents, there is a default output size for all plots, and I forget exactly what it is. It's like, uh, I wanna say it's like six inches by nine inches or something. Uh, you can modify it as a chunk option, but it's sort of an art to get it exactly dialed in right. Um, and I could cover that in lab better than I can do it now. Sort of an art. You'll figure it out though. Okay, same thing for saving to disk. Okay. So we want to make this not look like garbage. So maybe we could follow lines instead of dots. So if this is a whole bunch of different countries, we would like to have lines following each country across. So I could change G on point to G on line. Okay, that didn't help. So by changing G on point to G on line, I still have a size three red thing, it's a line. But what it did, which is stupid, is it drew a single line through every single dot on my plot in the sequence they are in, in the data, okay? This is probably not what we intended. The problem here is ggplot doesn't know how to connect these lines across the country. So it just thinks we want to connect every single one of them as one line. So what I can do is say, ah, let's add a new aesthetic. This aesthetic I add to the first layer is called group. I say group equals country. What this tells ggplot is that we want any kind of groupable thing, for instance, a line, we want it to pass through all the observations for each country. So now it's going to draw one line for each country instead of one line through every single dot, okay? This is an improvement. This looks a little more reasonable. It looks like there's lines traveling from left to right. We can actually see some of them kind of jump out doing this, but we still can't see it because the lines are too thick. So what I can do is modify the size. I say, get rid of size equals three, and now we have smaller lines over here and we can actually see, oh, these look like reasonable observations for life expectancies in different countries across time. The thing is though is, maybe I wanna be able to tell these apart. 
So maybe what I want to do is instead of having all my lines be red, I could have a different color for every country, but that's a lot of different colors and it's going to be hard to tell them apart. So why not do a different color for each continent in my data set? There's only five represented, so let's see what that looks like. Okay, now I've made it so that there's one color for each continent and we can see themes pop out immediately. See how I did that? I grouped on country, but then I added color equals continent after it. Our lines are still going through all the, all the individual countries, but our colors are determined by continent. So I can go over here and see African countries are this color, the Americas are this color, Asian countries are sort of spread throughout here, the European countries tend to be up here. Uh, there we go, okay? Ah, so there's a question. What did you change in the four, size compared to three? Yes, so all I did was I removed size equals three. By removing it, it went down to the default, which is size equal one, I think. And then I added some colors. Okay, so this is nice. This is a little bit more sort of like readable, but I could take another step forward. Ah, so here's a question, a couple of questions. This is great. Is geomline empty because you don't want to specify a color? Geomline is empty because geomline is getting all its aesthetics from the layer above it. So this ggplot layer up here is setting default aesthetics for every subsequent layer. So I could write this exact same statement here um, instead like this. Let's copy this here. Uh, I could take this AES, uh, and I could put it in GMLine. and get the exact same result. It's a little pixely because of my zoom, um, but this is exactly the same thing. So basically by putting this AES up here in the top layer, it propagates it downward so it also is the same AES in GeomLine. I just don't have to write stuff in GeomLine because it's already up here above it. But if you wanted to say, two different aesthetics that had di are two different layers with different aesthetics. You could give each of them their own AES and they'd be different. Okay, so the next question here was, uh, um, why do I add color equals continent in AES? So color equals continent, if I wanna map color onto a variable, it has to be inside AES. That's just sort of the syntax of ggplot. Uh, the next one, is the legend of continents popping up automatic? It is. ggplot automatically generates legends if you assign a color to something. A color or a shape, it automatically generates a legend. You can turn it off if you want, but by default it gives you one. Uh, and lastly, by using only the color option in GeomLine, it yields an error. So you truly need the full AES call. Yes, so you need the AES if you want to map it to a variable. If you don't want to map it to a variable, you don't need AES. So I could say, for instance, uh, let's say color equals blue. All the lines are now blue, but I can't say uh, color equals continent, or it's going to get angry at me because I can't find this continent object. But I could say AES color equals continent. And now it will work and reproduce the plot. It's the particularities of ggplot. Okay. Okay. So a better way to do this, rather than still plotting them on top of each other, might be let's make a different plot for every continent. Okay. Now, if you're in other platforms, this might be a pain in the ass. It is not in ggplot. I can add a layer called facet wrap. I say here, facet wrap tilde continent. This says I want a bunch of different facets, which are subplots. I want them to wrap over lines. So essentially they'll keep going until they run out of space and then go to the next line. And I want them wrapped over the continent variable. So what this does is I now have one individual plot of life expectancy over years um, for every continent. Okay. 
So doing multiple subplots and stratifying is trivial in ggplot. It's actually one of the coolest, most powerful features is you can do subplots like this on any variables you want with just one little line. Okay, I love this and um, once you kind of get used to doing it, you do it all the time. You'll be stratifying on stuff constantly. Okay. So the problem now is that having broken this out into multiple plots, all my text is too big. Okay. So I get rid of base size equals 18 and it comes down to a better text size. So here's a question. This is assuming you have every country coded by continent in your data set, right? Yes, exactly. Anything that um, didn't have a continent value, if it had an NA, it might create an NA facet, um, or it might drop it depending on the settings. So you need to have, you can only facet over things that you have uh, basically some variable for and, and values for. Okay. Uh, okay, so now I've made the text back smaller. I could make another improvement. Uh, oh, so here's a great one. You're following along in either my slides or the, uh, the syntax file. So if you look at every one of those uh, um, entries of code in the slides or whatever, notice where those things line up. The hashtag uh, less than less than are what highlight these things purple on a line. So yeah, that's me actually highlighting the code stuff. It's a little uh, feature built into sharing and I used to make slides. Um, yeah, so essentially what's going on there, Alex, is uh, it is by removing base size, it just goes to its default text size. So another thing I could do is, well, maybe I'm wasting a lot of space over here on the right with my legend. I could bring this legend into the blank spot on my plot. I say here, I add a call called theme. Theme you should usually add at the end. Theme is a generic um, layer you can add on to modify all the tiny little weird things in ggplot. For instance, the location of a legend. I say plus theme legend.position equals a vector 0 0.8, 0 0.25. These are absolute xy coordinates. If you imagine the bottom left corner is 0, 0, and the top right is 1, 1, this is 80% of the way to the right and 25% of the way up. So I've just stuck my continent legend over here in the white space. It's a kind of little tweak you do at the last minute if you want to fix it. Okay, but the thing is, is you'll notice. This just tells me what colors line up with what continents. Well, my facets already have labels for the continents on top of them. So instead of legend position here, I could say legend position equals none and delete the useless thing. Okay. So now we have sort of what I'd say is a kind of final plot. This is a, a basic no frills plot, but it shows life expectancy over time for all these different uh, countries within the different continents. It lets us track trends over time. It's not a bad plot, it's pretty good. Okay, do we have any more questions about this? Yeah. Absolutely, the last line is the most confusing line. Theme is a weird generic sort of function in ggplot. If I uh, do question mark theme, these are all the potential arguments you can give to theme. Okay. These are all different things you could change in your ggplot using the theme call. Theme is where you go um, if, like me, you are a very picky person and you want to change how every little thing looks in your ggplot, you're going to do lots of little calls in theme. You could do things like panel grid, X, panel grid minor dot x equals element blank and delete the little lines on, your, uh, on the background of your panel. There's a million weird things you can do in there. Don't attempt to memorize them. I sure as hell don't. I go and look these things up when I want to mess with theme. But theme is a very powerful function that you can use to modify literally anything in the plot. It's a way to get manually at the guts of a plot. Okay. And the nice thing is there's examples in here and documentation. If you do question mark theme, it documents every one of those arguments. And then at the bottom shows you a bunch of examples for how to do common operations. So there's good documentation. Okay, in this case, I just used it to delete the legend. Legend.position equals none, gets rid of that legend I didn't need. Okay, any other questions? Oh, here's a good one I just missed. How would you center the title? This is a theme call. Let's see what happens. So let's take this plot. That looks like this. Uh, let me get rid of the base size here so you can tell. Okay, 
So let's say I want to center that title text. Let's go with um, just title. It's title. Is that it? No, it's not title. Oh, duh. It's in, uh, not in theme black and white, it's in theme. Nope, that's not it. Uh, I'm trying to remember what it is. See, I got to look these things up too. Uh, it is, where it is? Plot.plot.title. Inherits from title, left line by default. Uh, well, the text is just, is it plot.title? There it is. Plot.title element text h just equals 0 0.5. So what this is doing is saying, okay, I want to modify something overall about the plot. The thing I want to modify is the title of the plot. It's plot.title. Well, plot.title is a type of element. That element is it is text. So I'm saying I still want my plot to be a text element. This is just the syntax in ggplot. I'm going to modify one thing. If I say, get question mark real quick, element text, um, in conjunction with the theme system, it lets you specify how non-data components of the plot are drawn. This is a way to specify how axes, labels, and things look on your plot. H just is the argument for horizontal justification. Horizontal justification goes from zero to one. Zero is left justified. One is right justified, 0 0.5 is center justified, okay? That's the kind of thing that um, you just would know if you spent seven or eight years bludgeoning this stuff into your brain. Don't worry about not knowing it. The solution to that is like Google center justify title text ggplot and the first answer will probably be what you want. Great question though. Okay, so. This is looking better. Okay, so maybe what we want to do is we want to create a plot and then store it as an object, either to save it and use it somewhere or just to store it and use it later. We could do this uh, the same way we assign any other object to something. I can say I want to make an object called life exp by year, and I'm going to assign to that this entire GG plot. If I do this, it's not gonna display the plot down in my little plot window. It's gonna save it to an object and then it is going to lurk in waiting to be used. If I then use this object, I call on it, it will display the plot. So I can now say life expectancy by year and it generates the plot we generate, right? It's gonna be sized appropriately to whatever thing we plot it to. It's just gonna show it. You might be like, well, why wouldn't I just wanna display them in place? The cool thing about ggplots, if you assign a ggplot to an object like this, you can still add more layers to it and modify things in it. So you can create a base plot by assigning a whole bunch of layers together and then add stuff onto it later so you don't have to retype all that junk over and over again. So in this case, I took that life expectancy by year plot and then I added the legend back to it. And it does theme legend position equals bottom. And now I got my legend back. Okay, this is a way that you can do things like uh, generate templates um, to reuse all the time by just modifying small segments of it, like picking particular variables and things like that. Uh, one of the last homeworks in this class is actually going to be writing your own functions that generate plots with, with like one or two arguments based on different variables and not writing all that plot code every time. That would be cool for making things like dashboards and things like that for other people. Anyway. Uh, so you can do that. Uh, then here's a random thing. A common thing you might do is draw some sort of scatter plot you want, um, except you're scatter plotting discrete units. So if I have something like a scatter plot of observations of uh, countries in continents in years, well, the thing is, is every single country in Africa in 1952 was observed in that continent and in that year. So we have no idea how many countries are under that dot, right? We haven't like aggregated our data and made them sized. This is something called overplotting. Overplotting is just when you have a bunch of stuff stacked on top of each other. You can't actually tell what's there. It's a common thing people ask me about, so I put a couple slides on it. To deal with that, we could jitter our dots. Jittering is a 
randomized movement of, say, scatterplot dots up and down and left and right to reduce overplotting. In this case, I said, you'll see from the previous slide, I have a jump point call here. I add to it position equals the position jitter function. Width equals 0 0.5 says the dots can move up to 0.5 units in either direction. If you're on a discrete scale, the space between each unit is one. So this says you can move up to halfway between. And height is up to two. So they could move up to two years up or down. OK? So what this did is it now made it so all these scatterplot dots are spread out. So we can see, obviously, there are a lot more African countries than some other continents, right? This isn't even really a continent. Not only does this continent have the most annoying name, Oceana, it's not spelled that way. It also doesn't have very many countries in it, you silly continent. Okay, so position jitter is a nice way to fix overplotting. Okay, good one to know about when you need it later. Another thing you might want to do is mess with the axes on your plot. You can modify axes in lots of different ways, and this isn't just labeling them or moving the ticks. You can rescale axes, okay? So if you want to change the range of your axis, you can add an X limb or Y limb layer, and this will, given two numbers, change the minimum and maximum values on that uh, axis. You can also change to things like logarithmic or square root scales on your axis using scale X like log 10 or natural log or scale Y square root for square root scales. Okay? You can also change where the breaks are, that is where it highlights it on the legend. So if I look back here, it's highlighting like 1980, 90, 2000. You could make it highlight on where the actual data are, like 52, 57, and so on, by giving it those breaks. Okay? Here's an example you might play or do something similar. So here I'm, I'm doing uh, the China data from before. So I say, make a ggplot, data is equal to China. On my x-axis, I want year, my y-axis, GDP per capita, and I want to make a line plot. If you know anything about the meteoric rise of China's GDP per capita over the 20th century, you know you probably want to use a logarithmic scale and not a linear scale because it's going to look like a uh, hockey stick, basically. Okay? So I say, let's rescale the y variable to be a logarithmic axis. So I say scale y log 10 is a base 10 logarithm. I say I want my breaks at 1,000, 2,000, 3, 4, and 5,000 dollars. But then I do something funny. I want my labels to be equal to scales colon colon dollar. This is a funky thing that I'm showing you. It's a little advanced, but you might want to use it yourself. This says, go into the scales package, which is a, a package built into the tidyverse, for a function called dollar. What the dollar function in scales does is it takes these numbers up here, 1,000, 2, 3, 4, 5,000, and then it adds a dollar sign in front of them, a comma where it should go to break them up into dollars, and a sense position. So this takes these numbers and reformats them as text over here to make it look pretty. This is the kind of thing that saves you the labor of manually modifying your uh, variables to be you know, text like that. So I use the scales package in dollar. Scales has scales for all sorts of different things to take out the hard work of doing that. I then say I want my X limits to begin at 1940 and end at 2010. So it goes 1940 to 2010. And then I add a nice title to it. And now I have a better GDP per capita uh, like measure. And you can actually see here that um, in terms of logarithms, China has a basically a nearly dead linear rise in GDP per capita. Logarithms are nice for that sort of thing. Okay, So this is a much nicer plot. And you can see everything's unevenly spaced in real units because it's logarithmic scale. That makes sense? It's a little bit more advanced, but it's the kind of thing you might steal. Um, so if we were to do this on a non-logarithmic scale, would the layer be uh, by scale y? So if you, you, um, so if you wanted to change the breaks and the labels and you didn't want a logarithm, it would be scale y continuous. So I could show you this exact same plot. Uh, I have to create the China data really fast. Uh, uh, 
Fittler. No, Fittler is not the same as filter. Um, uh, okay, so this is what it would look like, uh, what it looked like on the one I just showed you on the slides. If I change this to continuous, now it's just the linear scale. And you can see why I plotted it logarithmically, because it goes Okay. So here's a question. Why the only the one uh, parenthesis there after dollar? Where does it begin? So the parenthesis here is the parenthesis that opens scale y continuous. It closes here. You might be like, if dollar is a function, where are its parentheses? The tricky thing is, if you don't have any arguments to a function, you don't have to give it parentheses. You can treat it like another object. In this case, it has no direct arguments to it, so I don't have to give it the parentheses. I could possibly put them there like this. Nah, it has no arguments. It doesn't like it. No parentheses. Just the finicky thing about it. That makes sense? You'll learn these oddnesses over time. Can you give an example using facet grid? Yeah, that's a good quick one I can do with facet grid. Um, let's say, uh, ooh, actually Gapminder does not have any useful things to facet over grid. People ask me about facet grid. The problem is there's no obvious things to stratify over with uh, um, Gapminder, uh, but I could use an example in say, Empty cars. So, empty cars is a Motor Trend cars data set. Uh, AES, let's say uh, x equals horsepower, y equals miles per gallon, uh, plus g on point, plus uh, facet grid. Let's facet on. Uh, gear and the automatic transmission. Okay, here's an example of facet grid. So what I've done over here is um, three, four, and five are the number of gears in the car's transmission. Zero and one is whether it has an automatic or a manual transmission. Confusingly enough, AM zero is automatic transmission and one is manual. And then it shows miles per gallon on the y-axis, horsepower on the x-axis. So you'll see there aren't even any observations over here in this cell or in this cell. It still shows them. So this is facet grid. If you have two categoricals you want to use, it's a, a good way to go. Uh, it says, do you always have to put your AES before the others? So uh, in what way? Before other things like? Like your facet grid or other functions of the plot. Uh, no, the only thing that has to come first is ggplot, but I can sort of arbitrarily rearrange these things all over the place. Um, so for example, I could put, uh, you know, I could put facet grid up here and then take this AES uh, and put it down in here. Um, everything's gonna work exactly the same. I, if I did, however, go like uh, color equals red first, Okay, that'll work. What happens if I put it at the end? In fact, it might just know. That works either way. So it's pretty arbitrary with the order. Most functions in R are not arbitrary about the order unless you name the arguments, but ggplot is pretty smart. Did I answer your question? Or? Yeah, that's great. Thanks. Okay. Uh, so here's a question. Can you plot out the y-axis so 1,000, 2,000, 3, 4, 5 are equally scaled? You change the scale to uh, well, like 10 line right. So what do you mean by equally scaled? Are you saying equally distant on the scale or? Yeah, yeah. so like at the moment you've got 1,000 really big and 4,000 and 5,000 really small. So how do you make them all equal in presentation? Equal in presentation, uh, one second. Um, I stole my uh, AES, uh, x equals here, y equals xp. So, uh, wait, not life expectancy, GDP per capita. So I'm not sure what you mean by equal in presentation. Yeah, that's what I meant. That's from how oh, it looks okay. now. Yeah, okay, yeah, it's just lin linear like that. And so um, if I change it back, you know, log 10, now it's logarithmic. It's just controlling this 
scale, but they're all they're they're the spacing will always change. Um, you have to change to logarithmic because it becomes multiplicative. Yeah. Okay, but you just put in continuous, and that's how you make them all. Easy. Yeah. Yeah. So Great, continuous thanks. is the default uh, scale for anything that doesn't have a transformation. Good question. Okay, I'll keep chugging along because we don't have so much time, so many slides. Okay, uh, next one. Uh, maybe your fonts are too small. I kind of showed this with base size. You can put base size in a theme call like this and it'll change it, or you can put it, um, uh, you can do it in theme. I forget how exactly to do it in theme. Um, but yeah, you can mess with text sizes. You see that changes all the text on the plot. Um, okay. So you can mess more precisely with all sorts of things on these plots using theme, like I mentioned earlier. You could do things like uh, make your plot title much larger by saying plot title equals element text size rel2. This says relative to, makes your thing twice as large as it originally was. 0 0.5 would be half as large. Uh, HF just zero would left align it. You could do things like rotate your x-axis labels. Um, you could make your labels blue. You could make your axis ticks longer. There's all sorts of things you can mess with. You're welcome to mess with these things in your homework or, or do whatever you want. See if they work, ask in lab how to do some weird things. Uh, I won't dwell on them because there's an infinite supply of things you can do. Um, but you can modify basically everything in it, and most of that happens in the theme call. You can also modify scale. So I showed you the scales with scale y log 10, um, but every mapped aesthetic in ggplot has some corresponding scales. Um, they have a common syntax like scale, the aesthetic you want to use, and the option for that thing. Aesthetics are things like color, shape, line type, um, and the option is something like manually setting it, making a continuous value, or a discrete value. Some examples would be like scale line type manual would allow you to manually specify the type of line for every line in your plot. Scale alpha continuous would vary the transparency of whatever you're scaling on some continuous variable. There's also things like scale color brewer, which you could set specific palettes to make your plot follow different palettes. Brewer is nice for picking things that sort of take colors that are on opposite ends of the color wheel. Um, there's uh, scale color viridis, uh, which is really nice for making things that are colorblind friendly. There's a million different palettes out there. These are all scales. Just know that if you want to modify something like the color distribution of things, the shapes and sizes, it's probably a scale. Google for scales or ask me. Okay. Here's an example of doing a manual scale. So here I took my plot from before, life expectancy by year, I put its legend back in, and then I said, okay, I want to manually set every color in this plot because I am a particular person. I say, I want the name of this scale to be, which continent are we looking at? The slash N makes a line break in the title of the legend. Which continent are we looking at? And then I manually set my colors. I say the values are going to be, this is a named vector. A named vector is a vector where the values have names. So the names come first, the values come second. The values here set the color, the names set the continent or whatever they're associated with. So this is me saying I want my colors set so that Africa is going to be sea green. So Africa, this is sea green. The Americas are turquoise one. This is turquoise one. Asia is royal blue. Europe is violet red. Oceania is yellow. And you'll see it updates the lines and it updates the legend. This is manually setting colors. You probably won't do this too often, but this is how you do it. And I do make you do at least one manual legend in the homework to display that you can do it. Don't have to do anything fancier than this, but it's an example. Okay. Uh, I recommend playing with this if you're curious how it works. You might be like, where the hell did all these colors come from? R has lots and lots of built-in colors, which you can get a list of, uh, not color rows, colors. This is all the colors built into R. There are 657 of them. They're just names. 
You could also instead give it hex codes. Uh, if you want to use uh, like RGB hex codes, it'll take them. Okay. Uh, so here's an example for a big complicated plot I'm going to show you. So this is a fussy manual legend plot where I've done two manual legends. There's a lot of weird stuff in here. This is an example plot you could steal some code from, but I wouldn't expect you to be able to generate this yourself. I say here I'm making a ggplot plot of the gap minder data. Here on the x-axis, y-axis is life expectancy. It's going to be grouped by country. I have geom line, 50% transparency, and I get some weird things in AES. I say AES color equals country in quotes. Size is country in quotes. This is mapping the color of this over to a scale uh, or to a fixed variable, which I generate inside of my plot. This is a weird thing. I say geom line stat smooth equals lowest. This is going to draw a smooth line through my plot. I do a facet wrap. I do a manual color scale for things, manual size scale, and then I tweak some things in uh, the theme. Let's build this out to show you what I'm doing. Okay, I start with this base a plot. Gapminder data, years on the x-axis, life expectancy over here. I've grouped on country, but you can't tell because there's no data being plotted. I add to it a geom line. This is one line for every country in my data because I've grouped on country, add line. I then say I want to add a geom line where the stat is equal to smooth, method is lowest, grouped on continent. What this has done is you can't see it because I haven't colored it. This has drawn a line that is a average uh, life expectancy for every country in that given continent per year through the middle of all the observations. You can't see it because it's black, right? So I'm going to, okay, next I do a facet wrap. You've seen this, facet wrap by continent. This just says make sure there's no more than two rows in it, okay? Then I add a manual color legend. You'll see this adds things in a couple of spots. What I do is I say AES color equals country. Notice this is quoted. I'm not mapping it to the country variable. I'm instead mapping it to the word country. This is going to make geomline go down to scale color manual and look for something named country, which is mapped to black. So this for the geom line of the individual countries, it sees black and assigns the color black. For the geom line that's grouped on continent, I've assigned color to the word continent. It looks into scale color manual, finds continent, and then draws a blue line. This is really complicated. Don't, it's fine if you're like, I got no idea what you're doing here. This is an example of the weird complex stuff you can do in ggplot if you're a finicky person, okay? But basically, this is just a way for me to do it so that this line that goes to the middle of each continent is blue, and then all the countries have black lines. I then change the sizes so that the one that's mapped onto continent has a size of three, and countries have a tiny 0.25 line. So it's made the country smaller and the continents bigger. Then I make the countries partially transparent. Alpha 0 0.5, and I do it with the continents, 0 0.5, so you can now see through them. A little better for overplotting. I do a minimal theme, changes the theme to use a little less ink. I also add a year's y-axis. I remove the X label. I add the title. Life expectancy in 1952 through 2007 with a subtitle of by continent and country. I do theme x axis text angle 45. Because my years over here were overlapping, I rotated them 45 degrees. A better thing to do might be to use fewer labels, but I rotated them 45 to show you you can do it if you want to do that in the future. And then I move my legend to buy me a little bit more space. I bring the legend in to waste less white space. And that's the final plot that I have. 
This is a complicated plot with a bunch of manual axes, the type of stuff that maybe, you know, eventually you'll work up to being able to do comfortably. But I will tell you right now, I couldn't do this within the first, you know, year I was messing with ggplot. I would have had to constantly refer to other things. Don't worry about it, but I'm kind of just showing you you can do a lot of complicated things if you want. Okay. Uh, quick question I always ask each term. Uh, what happened in Africa in the early 1990s and Asia in the mid-1970s that might reduce life expectancy very suddenly for only one country? Only one country, though. AIDS epidemic did do a lot to Africa. That's all of the lines going down up here. What about one country? Rwanda genocide. Rwandan genocide. This is the Rwandan genocide over here. This is the Cambodian genocide over here. Uh, I taught a unit on genocide this summer in my criminology class, and I always, I'm always, i glad I talk about this. Almost nothing drastically drops the life expectancy of an entire country other than genocide. Even things like the AIDS epidemic, major disasters, they do not drop it like genocide. The only thing that comes close are very large famines which was sort of, this is a um, kind of famine over here in the sort of Great Leap Forward in China. Everything else, by and large, you know, things do not drop like that. Uh, the Vietnam War has a bit of a dip in here, but you barely can see it in here compared to the genocide. Genocide is nuts. It is really bad. Um, if you saw Sudan in here, um, you would see a little bit of a Sudan dip uh, in Africa up here too. Um, yeah, pretty bad. I taught on the Sudanese genocide in uh, the summer. Okay, so more on customizing legends. The uplifting topic of genocide, yes. Um, you could do things like move legends around, flip their orientation, remove them, a lot of things you can do. I would recommend going to like the cookbook for R to look at these sorts of things. Um, don't try and memorize all this stuff. Just know if you want to do it, there's a way to do it. The trick is finding it. Go to a website like this. Don't try and just do question mark on scales and stuff, uh, at least not at this stage. You'll figure it out over time. Um, if you want to save plots to an actual image on your computer, there is a function called ggsave to do this. Um, if you make an R Markdown document and you have images in it, it will normally create an image directory and save all the plots in there automatically. Um, but if you want to save them and like export them and use them, email them to somebody, you can use ggsave name the file something, by default it will save in your working directory. You can tell it what plot object you want to save, and you can specify the height and the width and then in, in whatever unit, so inches, centimeters, pixels, whatever you want. Um, by specifying the file uh, suffix like .pdf, it will save it in that format. If you do .png, it will save a ping file, .svg will save an SVG file. You can do whatever you want, JPEGs, pings, PDFs, okay? Um, now, if you just want to quickly send somebody a memo or something, you can also just open that little viewer window in our studio and screenshot it and send to somebody. It's not reproducible, but I will freely admit I do that all the time when I send quick things to people because it's really fast. Okay? So, that's how you save things. It saves to your working directory. You could give it a path and save somewhere else if you want to. <clears throat> okay. Now I'm gonna just show a couple bonus plots um, with some code to kind of show you some uh, ggplot power. Uh, so ggplot is perfectly well suited to making publication ready plots that might drop straight into a journal article. So this right here is the complete syntax for a plot that you could find in a not so recent anymore article of mine. So this is a city and community paper back in 2018. Uh, oh, so yes, where's the figure folder? Uh, if you make an R Markdown document, it should create a figure folder in the folder your R Markdown is in. Otherwise, it saves to your current working directory. Uh, so this is the complete syntax for a plot. This is a, a plot of estimated probabilities um, with a lot of syntax. I've got some stuff you haven't seen, geom error bars for putting error bars on scatter plots. I've got geom plot for a dot plot. I did some manual scaling. I tweaked my themes and stuff, but honestly, there's nothing too fancy going on in here. This is the plot that actually appears in the article. You go open up that article, this ugly ass plot is sitting in there. It's very simple, um, but it conveys a lot of information and it's an untouched, unmodified ggplot one. It's even using the default theme black and white, right? This plot conveys a lot of info though. So I do um, uh, research on bias and policing as one of my areas of work. 
This is a plot that shows the probability that a person will be arrested uh, given the race that the police uh, are responding to, the race of the, the target, essentially the police call, the race of the person who called the police. So the Seattle Police Department foolishly gave me data, including the race of the caller, which they record for like uh, police calls, like 911 calls, um, apparently with follow-up interviews. So I could look to see if the police are more likely to arrest someone when a white person is calling the police versus a black person in white or black neighborhoods if that person is white or black. So this would show you, for instance, that if you're in a stable white like North Seattle neighborhood and somebody calls the police on you for a nuisance crime like vagrancy and you are a black person and the person who called the police is white, you have an 88% chance of being arrested by the police. Okay, as compared to if you are, uh, if a white black person called the police on you in that same neighborhood, it would drop all the way down to about 79%, which isn't huge, but it's significant. Okay, this is a just normal default ggplot. I didn't do anything too fancy. I took my legend, I brought it inside here to some white space. This is facet grid. This is facet grid over neighborhood types and crime types. Okay, facet grid. Uh, geom point, geom error bars for confidence intervals, mess with it. It's everything I've shown today. You can put it in a publication. Or you could gussy stuff up a lot. So this is a plot that I had. It's a raw GG plot that was in my job talk yesterday because I had to try and impress people. So this is one where it's still a raw GG plot, but you see I've modified Fonts. I've plotted multiple model results on the same thing. This is an output of some models of uh, uh, crimes like homicide, gun assaults, robberies, violent crimes, and property crimes um, with different conditions like uh, collective efficacy. If you're a sociologist, you know it. Otherwise, don't worry about it. It's what my dissertation is on, and no one cares except me. Um, abandoned buildings, vacant lots, bars and liquor stores, and mixed land use on individual census blocks in neighborhoods in Chicago. This plot basically conveys that if there are abandoned buildings, more abandoned buildings on a block increases the rate of homicide on that block, net of a lot of other factors, conveys a lot of information. Um, but basically these are data coming from five different statistical models and then behind the hood, five different structural equation models to get these percentages. It's all getting calculated and dumped into a single plot. So you can do pretty crazy stuff with ggplot. This isn't touched up using some external software or anything. This is just a pile of code. It actually fits on one screen. The code is a little bit bigger than this. I don't show it because it's got some really weird stuff under the hood. Um, but you can do tricky and complicated things. ggplot can make things completely ready for advanced presentations, for your journal articles, all that kind of stuff. It can do what you need. You don't need to go and touch things up necessarily in like Adobe Illustrator or something. But if you want to touch things up in Adobe Illustrator or something, save your files as an SVG. You can open them up and modify them. It, that's basically an Illustrator friendly format if you want to touch them up. Okay. One last thing I want to do, uh, I want to give a plug. This is a really good book on using ggplot. This is Data Visualization, a Practical Introduction by uh, the wonderful Kieran Healy. If you're familiar with Kieran Healy, he's a very fun person to follow on Twitter. Um, Kieran Healy is a sociologist. Uh, I think he's at Duke. Um, this book is a uh, visualization book spec specifically on the tidyverse and ggplot for people with a social science background that is a non-technical background. It teaches you really good basic visualization principles. It uses ggplot and the tidyverse, and it's free. You can go to the website and the entire textbook is freely available online. You can buy a print copy. I keep it in close reach because it is a good book um, and also theoretically supports them. It's a terrific book. This is probably my favorite book for ggplot uh, to get for like learning it front to back and also learning good visualization principles for social science stuff. If you're from more of a um, physical or biological science, I would recommend Klaus Wilkie's uh, R visualization book. I forget the exact name of it. Um, it might, I think it's also free and online, but it come, he comes from a um, computational biology background, I believe. A little bit different background. Excellent books. The main thing, if you ever need a textbook to learn this stuff in R, 
don't pay for it. There is a free one out there that's better than the ones that cost money. If you want a hard copy, they're usually cheap too. Okay. So um, this is just some suggestions for things to tinker with you might do in your homework. Um, your homework, you're gonna be using that Gapminder data. I'd recommend doing things like filtering down the specific rows, uh, mess with different stuff, plot different X and Y variables, try and facet on different things. Um, maybe try some other layers I didn't show today and see how they work. Do geom histogram for histograms, density for densities, box plots. There's a million geometries built into ggplot, and there's also packages that add lots of cool ones. Okay? Uh, you might do things like use geom smooth to add low S smoothers like I showed, or to add regression lines, which I didn't show today. Um, you might also do things like mess with different themes. Like a fun one is like Jeff Arnold's GG themes package, which adds themes to make it look like a something from The Economist, the uh, magazine, Stata, if you want to make it look like ugly Stata plots, Excel plots, if you're, like I said, masochistic. You can do all sorts of different things. Here's a question here. If we wanted a hard copy for an R textbook, what is the best recommendation? Oh, it's still this. Uh, this is the best hard copy one. It is a beautiful, full color, uh, glorious, you know, like book um, that is super accessible and covers everything you want to use from basic visualization principles. It's not just coding, it's actual principles of visualization. It just is using ggplot for the examples. It's top notch. This and Klaus Wilkie's book are the ones I would get as hard copies. If you wanted to get to the nuts and bolts, uh, it goes beyond data viz. This one is mainly data viz. There might be a little bit of statistical stuff in here, but it's focusing specifically on data visualization. If you want to do stuff other than data visualization, I have recommendations for basically everything you could want to do if you ask me. I have strong opinions and I've read many books. Um, yeah. Um, <clears throat> Tufty? I like Tufty too. Uh, so I do have Tufty's like classic. Um, Tufty is great. Tufty is a hyper minimalist, and so it's always good to get high, highly opinionated people's things, uh, opinions. I like things a little bit prettier than Tufty, um, but Tufty is a good place to start. Too many people put way too much shit on their plots. Learn some Tufty. Like Tufty is like remove everything unnecessary, strip it down. Um, he's the uh, oh, what's her name? The uh, the like remove everything that doesn't give you joy person. Tufty is bad, except he also removes the joy too. Um, but uh, he is pretty good, and I do like Tufty. Yeah, Marie Kondo. Um, yeah, it's like that. So I like, I like the style of Kieran Healy a little bit more. He's also kind of minimalist, but dressed up a little bit. Tufty is hyper-minimalist. Tufty is more like, if you really want to get back to the history of it, look at Tufty. Kieran Healy is like, do you just want to go straight to the current state of the art? Healy, same with Klaus Wilkie. Uh, and if you really want to think, learn a lot more about this, take Chris Ados' data visualization class. He'll have you read Tufty and all these other folks and, and you know, that kind of thing. Okay. Uh, so yeah, some tinkering suggestions. Here's your homework. Your homework is pretty straightforward. Just pick some relationship or multiple relationships in these Gapminder data, which I've already introduced you to, so you can steal code to kind of work with it. Write up an RMD like you did this last week. Um, just exploring the stuff graphically. Uh, you could work with subsets or the whole data. All I want is do four to eight plots. Um, make your titles, your axes, your legends labeled clearly. Don't use raw variable names unless they already look nice. Use at least one facet wrapper, facet grid. Um, do at least one manual legend, but you don't have to do anything crazy. You can even kind of use the basic thing I did. Don't copy it exactly, but you know, tweak it. Um, maybe try to use other geometries. I didn't show like histograms, bar charts, uh, vertical, horizontal lines. Look into that stuff. Make it pleasant for uh, your peers to look at. Um, organize it in some way. So, uh, and do write up like a one sentence or two sentences after your plots to describe what you're looking at or trying to look at, especially if you're doing some weird stuff. Um, uh, hide your code. Use echo equals false in your chunks to hide the code so it just shows the plots in the text. Make it look kind of pretty. Try and make it pretty. Stretch yourself. Stretch your legs a little. Um, yeah, that's all it is. Uh, that's all I got for you today. Um, and if anybody has any questions, I'll answer them. Um, otherwise, that's it. Mm. I have a quick question, Chuck. Um, yeah. I, because I wasn't in the first class, I'm not sure if you already covered um, uh, how to do the peer review grading oh, yeah. or how you want us to comment. 
Yeah, um, it's pretty simple. Basically, um, for the first uh, three homeworks like this, um, just write like three sentences, just comment very basically, be like, I like that this thing, you did this thing, I saw you were trying to do this thing and it doesn't look like it works. Uh, it worked and like, be like, maybe you could do this or maybe you could try this. Yeah, that kind of thing, like, like two or three sentences and then the score is basically, uh, if they didn't hand it in, it's pretty easy. You just write a zero. Um, if basically um, it's broken, like they handed an RMD file that doesn't knit, you could basically be like, give it like, it's like a one. If you open up the RMD and look and they tried a lot of things and it just didn't quite knit, maybe it's a two, like they tried hard. It's kind of effort-based. If they basically got it, like all the things that are asked for you think are there and it's nice looking, it's probably a three. Um, be lenient, you know, um, be, be easy with each other. We're all learning this stuff together. Um, you're all gonna like pass no matter what. It's kind of just one of these things where um, you give people the most mild incentive ever to do a little bit better. I basically kind of try to do without scores and it really benefits the, the effort people put in to have some kind of a score, even if it's basically made up. Um, yeah, do that, but you know, be kind to each other and give some recommendations. And if you just learned something like you were struggling a lot with this and somebody did something fancy, it's perfectly fine to be like, oh wow, this is like above and beyond. I learned this thing from it, that kind of thing. Um, and yeah, do, do, do a rating, just give it at the end of it, do like, Three out of, you know, three slash three or three points like that. The way it works is that um, I use the grade number you put as a, not even exactly an anchor, but it lets me draw attention. If I see three out of three, I'm going to glance at the homework, scan it up and down. And if I don't see anything immediately jumping out, I'm going to be like three. Um, if I see one or two, I'm going to spend some time looking at it. And if I see zero, I'm going to expect to see no homework was turned in. It's just a quick sorting thing because I usually got a grade like 45 of them. But I do look at every single one of them and I do reasonably often diverge in my scoring virtually always one point higher or something. Like sometimes people be like, it's a one because you didn't do all this. And I'll be like, I'll oh, take it easy on them and bump them up to a two. That kind of thing. Yeah. Anything else? When we're submitting our homework, should we copy paste the HTML in the comments? And the, oh, um, just upload as a file to the Canvas thing. So you can, to each Canvas assignment, upload both the HTML and the RMDS files. And if you do that, when somebody looks to at your peer review, um, they'll actually, the HTML page will pop up visible to them, so they don't even have to download it. Uh, yeah, just, and for the peer review score, just write it in the comment. Because you're not actually grading them, you're giving kind of like a, a summary score. I'm doing the actual like running through and grading these things. Yeah. Um, any other questions? I must have talked fast because I actually finished on time today. And honestly, they get a little shorter each week, and so I won't be rushing you all the way to 520 each time. <clears throat> Okie dokie. Well, nobody got anything. I will uh, see folks on Monday's lab uh, and then next Wednesday for data manipulation with dplyr. Don't miss that one. See you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Joe. Absolutely.